So he said, okay, I'll get you an interview. So I went along for my interview with uh, John Lennon and I was shown into this room and there's John and Yoko sitting there. And they said, hi, how are you? Who are you? I said, well, I'm the art director of Time Out magazine. Oh yeah, love the magazine, love the magazine. Little chit chat. And then they said to me, okay, in the next room, there's something in there. We'd like you to go in there and then come back and tell us what you think about it. Today on Rainbow Country, Paul and Trisha, the art of fluidity. A new documentary about visual artist Paul Whitehead, who's worked with the likes of Genesis, The Beatles, Peter Gabriel. Hi there, I'm Bennett Singer, a documentary filmmaker and the co-director of the new film Cured, which is currently available on PBS and on the PBS video app. You are listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. As an artist, all Whitehead interpreted the world around him. Here we are, the playground. (laughs) Welcome to my world. Creating dazzling works of art for legends in their time. Over the course of my career, I've worked with some really great people, like Peter Gabriel. Peter Hamill from Van de Graaff. Genesis art directed with John Lennon and the Beatles. But despite his success, the one thing Paul couldn't express. You learn very early on that what you do for a living as an artist doesn't conform with most people's norms. Was his true self. So they think you're a weirdo. Until he. To me, the actual transition takes place when I put the wig on. Discovered her. Power. Realize your power. I realized she's an identity. I want to be the prettiest me that I can be with all the physical handicaps I've got. (laughs) So without thinking what you're doing, you just start work. I have this ambition to be the transgender Bob Ross. (laughs) Paul Whitehead. I discovered that I didn't fit into a box. Trisha Van Cleef. By not fitting into that box. Two people enjoined together by art. She was going to upset people. After a lifetime of artistic achievement. As an artist, as a transgender person. He learned his masterpiece. It's not my purpose in life to make other people feel comfortable. May have been herself. My purpose in life is to make me feel comfortable. Paul and Trisha. The art of fluidity. Paul Whitehead. Hi, how are you? Very well, thanks. I have to say, thank you so much for being here to have your voice, uh, your story be heard by the LGBT community and beyond. So so thank you for this. Uh, especially to talk about your documentary, Paul and Trisha, The Art of Fluidity. Paul and Trisha, The Art of Fluidity. This is a documentary uh, essentially telling major aspects of your life, telling your life story. And here's my first question for you. Generally speaking, your general thoughts, what are your thoughts on this documentary about you and your story and your journey? What are your general thoughts? Uh, I'm very pleased with it. Um, It could have gone either way because I... From the very beginning, I said I wanted no input on the editorial content of it. Just, you know, make the documentary and draw your own conclusions. So it could have gone either way, you know. Um, we we started doing the filming originally because I needed like a 20, 25-minute loop movie to go in my art shows. You know, the sort of thing like they have in, in museums where you come in and there's a, a documentary going on a loop. And we started off shooting that, but it quickly became apparent that there was a bigger story to tell. And Sophia, the director, asked the producer if she could keep shooting. And he said, sure, carry on. So it finished up an hour and 15 minutes. And I think it's a very well-balanced, non-confrontational, very informative uh, documentary about a person's life. You know, my life, Obviously, I'm living it day by day. I don't think it's unusual because it's my life. But when it's seen through this perspective, it's it's kind of interesting. I watched it a few weeks ago, 
almost like it wasn't about me. And I thought to myself, wow, this would be really interesting for people that don't know about this kind of lifestyle to get this glimpse into somebody's life, you know. You just mentioned uh, Fia Pereira. She is an award-winning filmmaker. She directed uh, this this documentary on you. So you, you just mentioned it all started with having a, a short film to be part of your your art uh, gallery uh, exhibit. But who approached who? Like, did you approach like uh, like Fia or or a filmmaking company? How did that um, all originally start? Uh, Pre-COVID, I had a manager called Adam Fisk who was taking care of all my art gallery stuff. And uh, he was Fia's boyfriend. He's, he's another Englishman like me. And he lives he lives in America. And uh, he said, okay, well, yeah, we need to do a 20-minute film to, make, to, to go with the show. And I said, fine. He said, well, my girlfriend's a director. So I said, okay, let's let's try that. So she came over a couple of times, and there was just a chemistry between us. I felt very comfortable with her. Um, she was very informed about the whole, you know, LGBTQ sort of issues. And uh, the more we talked with each other, obviously the more I revealed about my life, and she kept asking me different things, and I'd tell her different anecdotes about little things that happened in my life, and it just got got going. It caught fire, you know. Mm. Were you ever apprehensive, nervous about telling your story, especially telling certain aspects of your story? Not really. I think I'm I'm too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's what's done is done. You know, you can't mm. change it. And I'm not ashamed of anything in my life. I'm I'm a, I have an amazing life. The, the places I've been. I've been very lucky to be in the right place at the right time several times in my life, you know. And uh, I'm still exploring my life. I mean, my life isn't over. I'm still every day interested in and interested in new things, exploring how I fit into all of it, you know. So it's an ongoing thing. So the art of fluidity had... Uh a very successful film festival circuit run. Were you surprised at the response of the audiences after seeing your documentary, after getting a glimpse into your life? Were you surprised at the audience's response? Yeah, very, very surprised because, you know, you look at the film and you go, okay, here it is. It exists as a piece of art. Then you show it to the public and you've got no idea what they're, they're going to think, you know. But I've got to tell you, we had some really, really amazing and quite profound Q&A sessions. A lot of people thanked us, you know, for, for doing this the way we did it. Uh, a lot of people came out to us. A lot of people said to us, you know, thank you for showing some light on this that is really non-inflammatory. A couple of people said it helps me to understand my son or my daughter. Um, it was quite touching, actually. And I think I said when we were making it, I said to Fia, you know, if this turns out well, we might be able to help some people out there that are struggling with this issue. And I know that we have. We have already, you know. And you just said this issue. When you when you say this issue, what do you what what do you mean? Do you are you talking about people that may be uh transgender, that may be uh gender non binary, that may be cross dressers? How do you see it? Um, I pretty much see all of those issues as, as the same issue, you know, which is basically honesty and being yourself. So anybody that's out there that's struggling with that, I mean, because of their, their social situation, their family situation, even their employment, you know, it can be very, very dangerous for them. And um, I was lucky that I didn't have to deal with any of that as an artist. I mean, they expect you to do strange stuff, you know. <laughs> they expect your lifestyle to be somewhat different. To be eccentric. So I never really dealt with, I never really dealt with, you know, blatant opposition or it wasn't dangerous to my career, as it were. Um, mainly because I grew up in the 60s and I, I came of age in the 60s. And it wasn't an issue, you know. I, I mentioned in the documentary, everybody around me was 
uh, experimenting, you know, gender blending, as they used to call it, trying on female clothes and, you know, trying out makeup and all that kind of stuff. It was just power for the course, you know. When you were making this documentary, when did you guys film? What do you mean? What time of the day? No, like what? Like was it pre-COVID, after COVID? It was during COVID, actually. And how yeah. was that that process? Did you guys have to, uh, you, you know, take precautions? Was was it limiting to film? Yeah. because of COVID. Yeah. Well, obviously, it was limited because we couldn't go out and do interviews and stuff like that. It was just between us. There was the the cameraman, Fia, and myself. You know. And we were careful. We, we we kept our distance with each other, wore masks when necessary, you know. Yeah, that kind of set the tone for the whole thing. It was a weird period of time, as you know. Mm -hmm. Especially so, to, to be doing a, a film, a documentary. Yeah. Yeah. But we didn't have a, a crew as, as you usually would. Mm. Um, yeah, it was, it was kind of like our little little hobby in a way that we were doing, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were a couple of times in, in, well, I mean, I can relate on multiple levels to your, to your story, but there are two specific moments in the documentary. Uh, autobiography of a yogi. I have that, that book. It's very thick. I've had it since the 1990s. I've tried to read it, but I couldn't get through it. <laughs> Really? I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. The uh, uh, Another aspect is uh, <laughs> Tibetan monks and them creating uh, mandalas in Toronto in the 90s. I was fortunate enough to uh, to see that because the monks were here in Toronto and creating uh, this huge, beautiful mandala. And those aspects are, are in this documentary. So here's my question to you. What got you into meditating, into the spiritual aspect? What got you into this originally? Um, in 1967, I was given the autobiography by a, a, a bass player I knew. He was already a follower of Yogananda. And he gave him this book. And he said, here, read this. Because I, I, I was obviously like, a lot of people in the 60s looking for my guru, you know, looking for some spiritual truth. And he said, read this, and it immediately connected with me. I mean, uh, like a lot of people I've heard say the same thing, that the face on the cover just zapped me. His eyes are so intense, it just zapped me. And then I read it, and every page of it was like, yeah, okay, this is interesting. It was, it was an insight once again into someone's life, you know, we we hear about yogis in the Himalayas and all that stuff. But this was a yogi living in, in the United States, trying to establish his his uh his fellowship and all the stuff he went through, it was quite amazing. And of course, as I say in the documentary, I got to the end and I was very disappointed that he died in nineteen fifty two. And I, I said I was disappointed because I wanted a guru I could talk to. You know, like a shrink, I could go and sit down with him and have a heart-to-heart -heart with him, right? <laughs> and, of course, that was a, a major sort of stupidity, dumb thing for me to say, you know. Because, <laughs> as you know from the documentary, I, I eventually met a, another guru called Sri Chimnoy, and I said, uh, I'm so glad to meet you, you're my guru. And he said, I'm not your guru. And I said, well... Do you know who is? And he said, yeah. I went, oh, fantastic. So who is it? And he said to me, I can't tell you. I said, what do you mean? You know who he is, but you can't tell him. What kind of a game is this? You know, he said, well, you have to find him yourself and you already have, but you don't realize it. So once again, I was like, this is some kind of mind game this guy's playing with me. So I said to him, well, let me ask you this. Can you give me a clue? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, your guru isn't in the body. And as soon as he said that, I went, oh, you mean Yogananda? And he said, yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. What about all the time I'd wasted? Because I, I'd been 10 years. I'd been to TM, the Hare Krishnas, uh, all these different gurus and religious leaders. And, you know, got the thing, did, did the 
with the money and the piece of fruit, got my mantra. None of it worked. So he said to me, you haven't wasted a second. Now he's ready for you and you're ready for him because the communication is on a spiritual level, not on a physical level. So that was my sort of insight into that world. And I've been pretty faithful. I, I serve Yogananda in Los Angeles. He has a, a shrine here in, in Los Angeles. And I'm an usher there when they have services. Mm. So I'm quite close to it, you know. Well, you read it and it didn't take, huh? Correct, correct. I, I, I tried to read that book, but I could not get through it. And uh, that is what it is. But it's there. Yeah, it's, it's sitting right there in my in my little uh, uh, library. Wow. So, did, you keep, did you keep looking? Did I keep looking? Uh, e oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. But, <laughs> but, you know, like certain things, certain things connect, other things don't, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I'm... I, I'm curious to know, I'm interested in knowing, when you saw your film, your story, your life up on the big screen, did anything ever, did anything ever surprise you about what you saw, what was revealed in the final product, even though it is your life? Did anything yeah. jump out at you when you first um, saw it? Yeah, there was one time, I think the second time I saw it, and I sort of, I'm, I'm able to watch it almost like detached, you know, it's like, first of all, you watch it as a piece of film, and there's a critique about the editing or whatever, right, the way the story is told and all the rest of it, but then it's me talking, right, and the thing I got the second time I watched it was there's a thread through my life. And that thread is is to stick to my guns. I've always stuck to my guns, even though sometimes it's been uncomfortable. Sometimes I don't know why. I just know what I don't want to do, you know. So I, I've always stuck to that. And it it came off pretty strongly to me. And I'm, I'm still like that. I know what I don't want to do. So don't keep asking me to do these things I don't want mm. to do. Yeah. Well said, well said. <laughs> the title, Paula and Trisha, The Art of fluidity. Is there a story behind choosing this particular title? Uh, I don't know, because uh, Fia chose that. Mm. And were you happy <laughs> but, with it? Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, I've, I've always had a problem with the, all the labels, you know, in the past, like, you know, cross-dresser, uh, all the different, you know. When I heard gender fluid, that really resonated with me. That oh, that's that's a very nice way of putting it. Yeah, I'm one of those. <laughs> I'm gender fluid because I do go backwards and forwards. There isn't a, a set way for me. You know, it's however I feel, whatever mood I'm in. So, yeah, that, that made uh, nice nice sense to me. It's not, it's not sort of harsh either. Gender fluid is a very nice way of putting it. Don't you think? I do. I do. Yeah. So, Paul Whitehead, you are you are a very successful uh, visual artist. You've worked with the likes of Peter Gabriel, The Beatles, Genesis. You're also in the Guinness Book of World Records for creating the largest indoor mural. You're also part of the LGBT community. I'm interested to know, I'm curious to know, how do you see yourself do you see yourself as as transgender as gender non-binary as as a cross dress as a cross dresser as uh gender fluid how do you see yourself i think the the best way to put it for me is is gender fluid mm. because i do go backwards and forwards and i'm very very uh secure and, and safe with each of those manifestations i i love to be a guy and do all the guy things. And I also like to create this female character. And like I say in the, in the documentary, I like to make the prettiest me that I can and manifest that in the world, you know. And of course, as I get older, that's more and more difficult, as we know, right? <laughs> but why not? I mean, I take great uh, sort of faith by some of the beautiful older women that I see in the world, you know. They're beautifully dressed. They're very secure in themselves. They don't care if they've got a few lines and so on, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just that manifestation. 
And I've always admired female clothes. When I was married, I used to very often select my wife's clothes for her, right? And she said, you are uncanny. You've got this uncanny knack of just picking the perfect thing. And I never made a mistake. So that was something that was inherent in me. I, I like beautiful clothes. I like to look, you know, comfortably beautiful. You know what I mean? I don't want to be like, well, of course it didn't all, all done up, you know. I like to be comfortable. <laughs> so the movie is called Paul and Trisha, The Art of Fluidity. And Trisha is your, essentially your alter ego. How do you, how does Patricia, how, how do does Paul allow Trisha to appear? Like, is there a feeling? Is there a sense that, that Trisha wants to come out? Or when do you decide? Or how does it? how is it decided? Well, that's a good question. Um, it's basically a frame of mind. I mean, people often ask me, you know, when you, when you create art as Trisha, are you always dressed up? And the answer is no, I'm not. I can be Trisha wearing male clothes, you know, it's just mm. a frame of mind I'm in. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a reaction to my male work. My male work is uh, it's usually about ideas, expressing an idea or a concept. Um, very detail-oriented, requires a lot of drawing, a lot of working out, you know, perspective and all the rest of it. And the paintings take a long time because they're pseudo-realistic finish, you know, a painting can take me three months, and it's a matter of painting old-fashioned style. And you know, there's a technique that I use, right? Trisha, on the other hand, is spontaneous. Um, she doesn't think about what the net result is going to be. It's like it's playful. It's like okay, I want to play now, and just play around with paint and brushes and all the rest of it, and see what happens which is very different. And I also work as Trisha very, very fast. I don't hang around. I don't don't perfect the thing. If In fact, Trisha always says that if you start to see the hand of the artist, if you start to see the brush marks, then it's time to stop. Hmm. <laughs> so let's, I, I want to talk about sexuality and gender, gender and sexuality, because there's an aspect in the documentary that I thought was really, really fascinating. Uh, as as Paul, you, uh, I'm I'm assuming sexually you would predominantly be more straight, mm -hmm. but as Trisha, at one point you said that you like men. Maybe you you were finding Trisha was finding her herself more and more attracted to men. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was so fascinating because sexuality and gender, like they're not necessarily like someone that may be, uh, you know, a cisgender male might be straight. And let's say he discovers his feminine side and starts dressing up. Uh, his sexuality, which would be heterosexual, heterosexual may change and it may not and I thought that that is so interesting and so fascinating, especially when you were ex express expressing that in the documentary that when you were when you were Trisha that you were saying that that you know hey, I I just might be interested in men down the road. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah, um, I always say to people I'm heterosexual in both genders, and that's it. It's as simple as that. As a, as a male, I'm uh, interested in women and all the rest of it. I, as a male, I never see myself being gay. I, n I never have any attraction towards males. As soon as Trisha puts on the female clothes, obviously you're presenting your, yourself to the world in a totally different way. And if you dress, you know, provocatively, you're a sex object, a female sex object, right? So, yeah, it opens up that door, you know. And uh, men become a possibility. Why not? Did that surprise you at all? Especially when you were first discovering this aspect of yourself in regards to to Trisha, and the more that you lived as Trisha, um, allowed, did 
did the did those attraction those attractions to men did it surprise Paul? Uh, it didn't surprise me at all. But the interesting thing was, I did discover, and I don't want to sound uh, sexist in in this remark, but I did discover what pigs men are. The way, the way they treat women is, and they treat you the same way. I mean, mm. to all intents and purposes, mm. you look and you act like a woman if you if you do it correctly, right? So, as you as Paul, did that influence how you treat women? Oh, of course, yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, actually, I've been very lucky in my life to al- always have a very close, intimate relationship with women. Uh, going back to when I was eight years old, I, I had a very interesting experience at school. When I was eight years old at my school, they announced they were going to have cooking classes. And I was like, oh, fantastic. I really wanted to learn how to cook. And then they said, oh, but it's for girls only. And so I was like, oh, what a drag. So I went home. I told my mother, I said, they have cooking classes at school and I can't, get, can't join because it's for girls only. So my mother, who was, who was always quite feisty, goes down to the school and says, this is ridiculous. My son should be allowed in the cooking classes. So I finished up in the cooking class, me and 30 girls. So from age eight or nine, I had a really intimate relationship with, with girls. It was like girls to boys are like this weird kind of species, you know. I was actually interacting with them on a very intimate level of cooking, you know, which opened up that door for me. And it made me realize no, they're not weirdos. They're they're kind of interesting. I found the whole girl female energy very interesting as well. The sort of nurturing energy. And so I was never afraid of girls. And in my dating years, I go out with my friends to the bars and everything trying to pick up girls. And I was always very comfortable with going up to girls and talking to them as girls, you know. Um complimenting on something, you know, oh, I like your earrings or I like your, your sweater or your dress or something. And it was sincere, you know, and girls would respond to it. My buddies who had all spent a few few pounds on drinks usually went home alone. <laughs> so, yeah, I've always had a very close relationship with women as friends, you know. Mm-hmm. When you are... Trisha, and let's say you you come across a man, and he he may not be treating you in in the best way possible. Do you ever find yourself like? Do you ever find Paul comes uh, starts asserting himself to to kind of uh, check that man, put that man in his place? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I say things like you know some guy. That may be like not ladylike to say or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, They come off with some line or something that's just really, really sexist, you know. And I look at them and I say, does that usually work for you? Because, you know, that's really fucked up, you know. Mm. (laughs) And they look at me and they go, what? So, yeah, that's that's not the way to to talk to women, you know. Mm -hmm. So why, why do you feel it's right to talk to me like that, you know. It's it's interesting. It's it's almost as if he, you should be giving TED talks in regards to heterosexual men, how to talk to, or maybe just like men in general, but how to talk to women, because they may be able to learn something from you because you've experienced it from both ends, from both yeah, sides. I, I think so. I think um, guys that grow up in families. Where they have more than one or two sisters, they they are more sensitive as well, right? But guys that grow up with the whole idea that girls are to be conquered, you know, they're they're notches on your on your gun, you know. Those guys just don't have a clue, and they never will, you know. And they think my approach to it is sissy, you know. Mm. If you show any inclination towards appreciating women or ad- admiring them or condoning their behavior or a sissy you know you don't understand it's like you should be like you should be like us you know a macho man you know and i mean look at the state of the world (laughs) that's Mm. where that gets you you know you are a very talented visual artist 
when did you dis- when did you begin to discover that aspect of yourself that you had a talent for the visual arts for drawing for painting uh it was very early on it was at school um preschool i always used to like to sit at the table with my little drawing pad and some crayons and everything and just play around you know and i soon discovered that if i could imagine something i could draw it and so of course when i got to school kids would challenge me they go hey paul can you draw a horse with a fish's tail i say yeah sure here you go and i draw it and give it to them and it was almost like magic you know and then um as I got into it a bit later, I discovered all these other artists, and I, I was lucky enough to have a teacher at school who spotted me and started to mentor me, you know. He would turn me on to different artists, and he, I'd go to museums with him and stuff like that because he saw my raw talent. And the more I learned, the more I realized, oh, this is fun, you know. You can you can do this for a living. Wow. <laughs> It was kind of an eye opener because nobody in my family agreed with me. Mm. My father Which wanted me to be an architect or mm-hmm. an engineer or something useful, you know. Does that, does the visual arts and that talent run in your family? No, not at all. You're the only one. Uh, my brother's a musician and also a painter. Mm. And with the seven years between us, and as we were growing up, we we both used to say, like, we're the weirdos of the family. You know, what's going on here? You're into music. I'm into painting. And nobody in our family appreciated it. It was like a, a sort of unnecessary skill that we had. You know, it wasn't going to get us a living. It wasn't going to make us rich, you know. But we both stuck to our guns. My brother is very much like me. He He sticks to his course and he does what he wants to do. He's actually a very excellent musical instrument maker Hmm. his instruments have been exhibited in museums and so on right wow so we're very similar yeah yeah earlier i mentioned you worked with the likes of uh genesis the beatles uh you created some album art for some of these artists talk to me about i believe it's the white album by the beatles how did that come about for you, that you created cover art for the White Album for um, the Beatles? At the time, this was like around 1970, at the time I was the art director of Time Out magazine in London, which is a sort of a very popular What's On magazine. And the word got around that the Beatles were looking for art directors because uh, they, they were doing this new record and blah, blah, blah. And it was sort of trendy to have an art director. So uh, I said, oh, okay, and a friend of mine worked there, and he said, well, I can get you a, an audition if you want, you know, an interview. And I said, sure. He said, which one would you like to interview with? And at that time, I was very much into John Lennon. I wish I'd have said George Harrison, because I think that would have been a much more interesting choice, you know. So he said, okay, I'll get you an interview. So I went along for my interview, with uh, John Lennon, and I was shown into this room, and there's John and Yoko sitting there, and they said, hi, how are you, who are you? I said, well, I'm the art director of Time Out magazine. Oh, yeah, love the magazine, love the magazine. Little chit-chat, and then they said to me, okay, in the next room, there's something in there. We'd like to go in there and then come back and tell us what you think about it. So, okay, so I go in the room, And the Beatles office was on Savile Row in London, which is where they make all the men's suits, you know, all the high-end men's suits. Laying on the floor was a men's suit, and it was about uh, 10, 12 feet long. It was huge, right? And it was pinstripe, you know, classic pinstripe suit, just laying on the floor. And there was a stool in the corner of the room, and obviously you were meant to sit on the stool and, and... come up with your thoughts what are you going to say about this right well i quickly realized that it was like a mind game and the mind game was if i stay in here too long and think of something to say they'll think i'm not smart or i'm stupid or something right however if i come out too fast and say something really really wacky 
that would work against me as well. So I sat there, what am I going to do? What am I going to do, right? We're in these head games with myself. So in the end, I thought, well, wow, I've been here for two minutes. I, I better get back out and say something, right? So I walked back out and I said the first thing that came into my head, which was, it's really great, but I would have liked it better in gray flannel. And they went, fantastic, yeah, great, lovely, great. And I got the job. But the thing was, I got the job, but I never saw them again after that. My job was basically to handle different projects, give this to this guy, and can you deliver that to this guy? And, of course, do my own design, which was a, a design of the Beatles, like Mount Fabmore, four Beatles in a mountainside. And what happened was, each one of the Beatles had different art directors. I think Paul had four art directors and Ringo had one. They all had these different guys. They finished up with so much art and good art, you know. They couldn't decide what to do. So in the end, they said, well, we'll just do a white cover. And that was that was the story. So my art director at Apple was very, very weird, very short-lived. And it was kind of, I was filling a post because they had to, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Were you happy with your 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 Mount uh, Fabmore, your Mount Rushmore of the Beatles? Yeah, yeah. I think it, it, you show it in the in the documentary. It's beautiful. Yeah, it worked quite well, and I even got the faces in similar poses to the the faces mm -hmm. on Mount Rushmore. You know, John Lennon is is uh, George Washington, looking straight ahead. I think George is Lincoln, and it worked out well, yeah, yeah. There's also a, a, a segment in the documentary where you talk about, a, you were part of a, a, a short documentary that Peter Gabriel created an original song for. And uh -huh. I believe that, that that song is played in the documentary as well. Yes. That How did that make you feel, having an original song by Peter Gabriel? Well, the way it worked, I'd, I'd worked with Peter Gabriel and, and knew him quite well, right? We shot the film, and the film was shot in a very unusual way. Um, there was a camera in, in the 70s and 80s called a Pixel 2000. It was basically a, a children's camera made by Fisher-Price, and it was a very crude digital camera. And you recorded the image onto cassette tapes, right? And it became like a cult thing. A lot of directors used this camera because it was difficult to work with to make short films and so on, right? So that's how the film was shot. And it turned out quite well. And then the director said to me, hey, Paul, do you think you could get Peter Gabriel to do the music? And I said, yeah, sure, right, yeah, no problem, <laughs> right? And then I thought about it and I thought, well, Peter Gabriel... It's kind of quirky. He likes unusual things. Maybe the fact it's made on this camera might appeal to him. So I said to Bart, the director, look, send it off to him with a note from me and see what happens. So he sent the film off and nothing happened for a couple of months. Then it came back and he put the music on it for us, which was great. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Yeah. So... Paul, here's my here's my last question for you. Your documentary. What do you hope audiences come away with after they've seen your documentary, after they've gotten a glimpse into your life, Paul and Trisha, The Art of Fluidity? Um, a couple of things. I hope that it helps diffuse all this nonsense that's going on right now about the LGBTQ issues and everything, right? I hope it... It sort of teaches people that there are many lifestyles, you know. And I'm not at all unique, but it's kind of a window into my life. Uh, it might help you understand, might help you with one of your relations or your, your children that you're dealing with with this issue. Um, it might help you to understand more, you know. I hope that's what happens. Hmm. Well said, well said. Paul Whitehead, well said, well done, well well lived your life and continuing, obviously. Yes. I have to say thank you for your time. Thanks well, for thank being you. on the show. Thank you. And read the autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> Get 
do another shot. <laughs> I just may do that. Okay. I have to say thank you again for your time and uh, and be well. And you, man. Thank you. You can stream Paul and Trisha, The Art of Fluidity on Apple TV as well as on Prime Video. For even more on this visual artist, simply check out his website, paulwhitehead.com. <laughs>